to be an amazing workshop uh, on quantum resources. And um, yes, so I'll be talking today about the a topic that has received a lot of renewed interest in the quantum information community uh, because of some, let's say, interesting recent developments that I will be talking also uh, about today. And um, yes, to understand, okay, you all know what quantum resources are, but to understand what reversibility is and what I will mean here by reversibility, we have to look at um, the second law of thermodynamics. And um, I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the second law to some extent, and uh, a very basic formulation of the second law that all of you will be familiar with is that if you have a system undergoing a transition where you, you're you not adding any more heat into a closed system, so it's an adiabatic process, then the entropy cannot decrease in this transformation. But actually, a much stronger statement of the second law can be made. What we can say is that in a suitable kind of like a axiomatic formalization of thermodynamics by uh, Lieb and Ingvason, what can be said is that this transformation is possible if and only if the entropy does not decrease. So in this sense, the entropy is the unique function that tells us which transformations of, of states of a physical system are possible under adiabatic transformations. So uh, this is remarkable because it tells us that if we want to study the convertibility of, of states of a, of a system, that the only thing we have to know is the entropy. This one function encodes everything we have to know about this possibility of conversion. And uh, one fundamental feature of this setting is uh, the reversibility. So uh, two states of equal entropy are connected by a reversible process. So we can go from A to B and from B to A. And for the purpose of this talk, uh, I will consider these ideas were essentially equivalent. So the second law, by, by the second law, I mean like a stronger statement of the second law, again, if and only if condition, which uh, is equivalent to reversibility, which is equivalent to there existing a unique function that governs all transformations. This is kind of this kind of uh, the, the the collection of features of the of the second law, and as you may have guessed, what we will be trying to do is to understand if similar statements can be made for other quantum resources, in particular for quantum entanglement. So we want to see if there is a unique kind of uh, entropic fun function that can govern the convertibility of entanglement in the same way as uh, the entropy does for thermodynamics. Um, so the talk will be broadly divided into two parts. And in the first part, I will try to tell you the history of this search for a reversible theory of entanglement and the motivation for it. And in the second part, I will talk about some of our recent results where we um, kind of we introduced a new framework for reversible manipulation of quantum uh, resources. And OK, so when we talk about transformations of quantum states, what we mean by that generally is manipulating many copies of quantum states because that's how we recover these macroscopic entropic properties of, um, of, of physical systems. And so in particular, what we will be studying is the transformation rates. So a transformation rate is defined, essentially we're transforming n copies of, of a state rho into um, rn copies of a, another state omega. So essentially we're asking how many copies of omega we get per copy of rho. Uh, but this transformation can be approximate. We allow some error, epsilon n, as long as this error goes to zero in the limit um, as n goes to infinity. Um, so, uh, yes, okay, the crucial aspect here, the crucial part of this definition is that we are constraining the allowed transformations. We, we in, the, in the same way as we allow adiabatic protocols in thermodynamics, we will be allowing some kind of free operations in this setting, uh, but I will get to that uh, shortly. Um, yes, okay, so in this context, we say that a transformation is reversible if the rate of coming from rho to omega is the same as the inverse uh, of the rate of coming from omega to rho, uh, in the sense that if we go from rho to omega and then again to rho, the overall rate is equal to one. And we will say that a theory is reversible if all for all states, uh, all pairs of states are reversible in this kind in this sense. But luckily, uh, especially for entanglement theory, we don't actually have to check every single uh, pair of states or uh, all pairs of states. We what we can actually define is two fundamental quantities. One is there's still an entanglement, and the other one is entanglement cost. They characterize the rates of going uh, transformations into and from the maximally entangled uh, two qubit uh, state. And with these two, two quantities, the question of reversibility is equivalent to asking is the distillable entanglement equal to entanglement cost? If this is true in the given setting, then we say that this reversibility of entanglement holds. And we can kind of uh, use this rate to understand the transformations. Like we have a unique uh, way of, of characterizing uh, the rates of transformations. Um, now, yes, so to talk about reversibility, then we have to fix what choice of allowed protocols we allow. 
So uh, traditionally, as many of you will know, for entanglement theory, the kind of the first studied class of operations was uh, local operations and classical communication, which is operationally defined and very kind of well understood, or well, at least uh, physically well understood class of operations. Um, and um, the remarkable fact here is that for all um, under these operations or all pure states, we get that indeed the disturbable entanglement of any pure state equals its entanglement cost and it equals the entropy of entanglement of the given state. Uh, so, yes, that is remarkable because it, indeed this is exactly what we are trying to find. This is a this show that pure states are reversible. So from uh, for every pure every pair of pure states, we can reversibly convert them. And the rate of this conversion is given by the ratio of their um, entropies of entanglement. So in this sense, yes, uh, we obtain the entropy of entanglement as a, as a unique kind of function that governs conversion of, of, of quantum states. Uh, but the issue is that uh, for mixed states, this does no longer this no longer holds true. Mixed states may be irreversible under LOC, and, and uh, actually uh, they can be very irreversible. So there is a phenomenon of bound entanglement. So uh, this means that there are entangled states from which no entanglement can be extracted at all. And it seems like this might cause some problems for the question of reversibility, but uh, the kind of it didn't make people lose hope. There was still kind of uh, an, uh, many kind of attempts at finding a reversible theory of entanglement because the example of, of pure states is the motivating kind of reason why we're looking for a reversible theory of entanglement. Uh, we already know that in some cases we have a reversible theory, so we essentially were trying now to see if we can get it in uh, in more cases also for mixed states. So the idea would be here that we can actually um, allow or uh, increase the trans transformation rates by allowing Alice and Bob, these two communicating parties, to use some additional resources. For example, um, the fundamental class of bound entangled states are uh, so-called positive partial transpose or PPT states. So these are they are bound entangled so that they are themselves useless for um, entanglement distillation. So we can say the idea is essentially to say, okay, well, since these states are useless, you can just use them for free and then see what you can do with these um, states. And uh, using such states, you can um, implement uh, what is known as PPT operations. And uh, the motivating example for the study of such operations is the antisymmetric Werner state. The antisymmetric state is known in, in, in entanglement theory as the, the universal counterexample state. Essentially, if you have any conjecture about entanglement, it's usually violated by this specific state. Uh, but here we see that, uh, remarkably, okay, this state is indeed irreversible under LOCC, but as soon as we allow these PPT states, or the, the, the Alice and Bob can implement the PPT operations, then the still entanglement equals entanglement cost, and then this state becomes a reversible in entanglement theory. Uh, so yeah, so this is a very motivating example to look at classes of operations larger than LOCC and to ask how we can obtain reversibility. And that is indeed what led Martin Plenier to pose this question as one of the most important open questions of quantum information in the year 2005. He asked about uh, what is the smallest class of operations that can uh, allow uh, reversibility of, of entanglement manipulation. And the way this is understood in a basic sense is essentially how much do we have to extend LOCC to allow for uh, reversibility. Uh, although there is conceptually there is a mild issue with this kind of phrasing of the question because, for example, the PPT operations I just mentioned, they have been many years later. They were shown by Xin Wang, who is here in the audience. They were shown to be actually irreversible, so they are not enough to, to give, give reversibility. Uh, however, this doesn't really mean anything significant for the whole theory because there are many different ways to extend LOCC. If you rule out reversibility for one of them, it doesn't mean that there's no uh, other slightly different way of extending LOCC. So essentially, this seems like a very complicated question to, to ask how to exactly obtain reversibility. So the idea would be to, instead of looking at like extending LOCC, to look at it in an um, axiomatic sense, to try to approach it essentially from the other direction, to try to um, introduce constraints that are essentially applied to every single uh, protocol, uh, in a reasonable allowed protocol. And uh, this is in this is actually very similar to the way that adiabatic transformations are studied in the kind of axiomatic approaches to thermodynamics. So for entanglement, this very naturally gives rise to the class of non-entanglement operations. They are defined as operate as those maps, those channels that do not create entanglement. So they map separable states to separable states, and that's a very weak constraint. So essentially, it's supposed to apply to all possible choices of allowed uh, protocols. 
And this idea underlie a series of seminal papers by Fernando Brandao and Martin Player that will form a central part of this talk. So I would like to talk about them in detail. Um, the idea would be, since we're studying asymptotic protocols, okay, we can relax this non-entanglement operations. We can allow some small amounts of entanglement to be generated as long as they vanish asymptotically. And that's the basic idea. So essentially, we remember that we are manipulating n copies of, of quantum states. And for each uh, step of the protocol, we can say, OK, we are generating at most delta n entanglement. And uh, this delta n has to go to 0 it, um, in the limit as n goes to infinity. So indeed, the, the point of this definition is that what um, Fernando and Martin conjectured uh, is that uh, this theory of entanglement becomes reversible under this checks of operations. So that still entanglement equals entanglement cost, and it equals what is known as the regularized relative entropy of entanglement. That's essentially a mixed state generalization of the entropy of entanglement of pure states. Uh, and yeah, so this is remarkable. This is, this is remarkable. Is, is this indeed an answer to the question of, of how to make entanglement reversible, um, seemingly? So as you may be aware, there are some issues with this uh, result. But before I get to that, uh, I would like to look at the setting here because there are some kind of maybe hidden assumptions in, in these kind of definitions. And in particular, this kind of asymptotic entanglement non-generation is a kind of is a surprisingly tricky uh, thing to understand because you see, uh, because this entanglement vanishes in the limit of the n goes to infinity, it seems like it's uh, just a mathematical technicality. It shouldn't affect the underlying physics the, if we allow this, these small amounts of entanglement. But what we showed with uh, Ludovico Lamy this year is that um, actually it, it changes the physics tremendously because if you don't allow entanglement generation, you get irreversibility. You cannot have a reversible theory that doesn't generate entanglement. Um, so that is a, quite surprising because it already shows us that entanglement contrasts with thermodynamics. Okay? For thermodynamics, you do not need to generate extra resources. You can do it adiabatically. But for entanglement, you cannot. You have to allow this seemingly small entanglement generation. This actually also contrasts with other quantum uh, resources that are known in other um, that we have shown to be reversible. Um, so this already changes the question that we are asking here. Because instead of asking, how much do we have to extend LCC? Now we know that the only question that makes sense is, how much entanglement we have to generate. Because we know that there is no reversibility inside of the set of non-entangling non operations. We have to go um, beyond it. Um, but how, how, to go, how exactly to go beyond this set is another tricky question. Because um, as I mentioned, the idea is to generate small amounts of entanglement and make it go to zero. But there is no unique way of quantifying entanglement. Uh, what Fernando and Martin used in their uh, papers is the so-called generalized robustness of entanglement. The, the robustness is a very nicely behaved quantity. It is uh, essentially defined in a simple way. It is a, a measure that essentially asks how much noise, how much noise do we have to add to a given state? So how much do we have to mix a given state with another state to make this mixture reverse? Uh, sorry, uh, separate, to make this mixture separate. Um, but it's okay, so this is just one way of measuring entanglement. You can ask, okay, what happens if we relax this constraint slightly? If we ask for a less restrictive condition, so for example, we measure entanglement with the relative entropy. Uh, what happens then, already Fernando and Martin showed this, the whole theory trivializes. So we can extract unbounded amounts of entanglement from any entangled state. And essentially that shows you that um, the theory makes no sense in a setting, you've allowed too much. Okay, then you can ask what happens if we um, restrict it more. So we essentially impose a stricter condition on the generated entanglement. And this can be done by choosing a larger measure of entanglement. So uh, a very natural way to have a larger measure of entanglement is to use, instead of the generalized robustness, to use the so-called standard robustness of entanglement. And that is defined very similarly, except for now we are also asking this noise state omega that we are mixing with to be also separable. It was a very closely related measure. But what we showed is that um, with this choice, you get irreversibility. So by changing the measure just slightly, completely broken kind of the reversibility um, that was studied in the, in the works of Prando and Plenio. And um, I want to clarify what this means. This means that for any reversible theory, any reversible theory cannot have this robustness, standard robustness going to zero. It has to generate exponentially large amounts of this robustness. 
So essentially, this already shows you that um, the asymptotic properties of entanglement theory they hugely depend on how you measure entanglement, and how you this how you measure this generated entanglement. But importantly for us, it seems like there is a uh, one choice of a measure that the that works, that seems to give us uh, something good. And it's like a Goldilocks choice of an entanglement measure that doesn't trivialize you. It doesn't allow too much. It doesn't allow um, not enough. It just seems to be perfect. Um, yeah, so with this, with these results, essentially what, what this establishes is a very tight characterization of the landscape of um, reversibility. And so the, the results that I just discussed they together, they essentially fully answer the question that uh, Martin Tanyu asked. Like, what is the smallest class of operations that can give us reversibility? Because right. here we have this one point that gives us reversibility, and we know that as soon as we go anywhere smaller, as soon as we impose any stricter constraints, we get a reversibility. Um, um, yes, it seemed like we were done with this question. Um, however, um, yes, a crucial uh, gap was found in the or original results of, of Fernando and Martin. Um, so the original proof uh, doesn't work. Uh, we do not have an alternative proof at this moment. We don't know if the statement can be recovered in different ways. Um, so I want to stress what this means because this has a huge consequences here because this framework, it wasn't just the first reversible framework of entanglement. It was the only reversible framework of entanglement. So without it, the landscape looks like this. This is what we, this is the state of the art. Mm -hmm. And that the, the kind of, the impression here is quite different because now we have huge amounts of irreversibility. And it seems like, I mean, we don't know what's going on anymore, essentially. We, we have lost this only known reversible framework. And um, the result actually, the, 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 the framework of, of Fernando and Martin was so general, it applied not just to entanglement, but also to other quantum resources. So these connections that were established there are now kind of put into question. Also, the framework introduced some very uh, strong connections with hypothesis testing, and in particular, something called the generalized quantum Stein's lemma. That result has been also put into question. But most importantly for us, most importantly for us, it, it brought us back to the beginning, to the question, can entanglement be reversibly manipulated at all? I want to stress here, we, we don't have a single way of making the tunnel reversible. That was the situation. And um, that is uh, the starting point of the second point, where we indeed try to answer um, this question. But now, so the way we approach it is to say that, okay, how we can recover entanglement without relaxing these constraints? Because we know that essentially, we, we cannot allow more entanglement generation. We cannot, we cannot allow less. We cannot really change much. We have to stay kind of inside the setting but get reversibility. So our idea would be, uh, is to look at the way that um, rates of transformations are defined. Okay, so you remember we defined the rates as essentially the how many copies you get of omega per copy of rho with the error going to zero asymptotically. Uh, but here the crucial thing is these lambdas, these uh, free allowed operations are constrained to be a quantum channels. So the idea that we have is to allow, uh, in addition to quantum channels, uh, more general probabilistic maps that can succeed with some probability. So one way to define a rate in this context is to say, okay, conditioned on the success of a protocol, uh, if, if this transformation, this probabilistic map succeeds, uh, you get the state omega that you that are desired target state, um, and this happens with some probability, right? So this is a way to define the rate, but there is an issue with this definition. You might notice there is this probability of success here, and it is completely unconstrained right now. So what this means is that because we have an um, asymptotic protocol, so what, what can happen here, for example, is that the uh, probability vanishes exponentially fast. And this essentially prevents any meaningful uh, realization of such a protocol. Um, so um, actually, um, what was so, okay, so the, the idea would be to, uh, to say that we constrain the probability of success. We say that we consider only probabilistic rates where the probability of success is bounded away from zero. Okay, so even when we are manipulating unbounded amounts of states, the probability of success has to remain larger than some non-zero constant. And uh, this already makes the kind of definition here more uh, much more reasonable, but maybe the definition still may look strange to some of you. So I would like to kind of provide some more motivation um, for this definition. Um, and for that, I would like to compare it with a different way of increasing rates. 
very commonly in information theory, we ask, okay, what if we relax this condition that the error has to go to zero? If we allow the error to be non-zero, can we get an increased rate? Can we have this trade-off? So we tolerate some larger uh, error, but we get a larger rate in, in exchange. Uh, so the, the ultimate trade-off that can be obtained in this way is known as the strong converse rate. The strong converse essentially is lar the largest rate that can be obtained with this error, but it's still not trivial essentially. So as if you're above the strong converse rate, your error has to go to zero, so the, the conversion, uh, the error has to go to one, so the conversion becomes um, impossible. Um, yes, so the strong converse rates are, are defined using quantum channels. Again, I want to stress these are deterministic rates. So it may seem like they are not related to what I just talked about, these probabilistic rates, but actually what we show is that our probabilistic rates, they sit in between the standard deterministic ones and the strong converse rates. Um, so in particular, what this means is that the probabilistic rates I just defined are well behaved, are still constrained under the same constraints with whether we have for strong converse rates, uh, and they don't do anything crazy. It's actually, they fit nicely into this, this formalism of asymptotic rates in information theory. Um, okay, so with this motivation, we now study the conversion of states under these rates. Uh, so yes, what we do is we define, we take the asymptotically non timing operations that Fernando and Martin studied. So we, we define in the same way we use the generalized robustness measure to quantify the generated entanglement. Uh, and we impose that this entanglement goes to zero. Uh, so yes, so in, in this framework, start. indeed, our main result is uh, Where is the, the ballroom? Ball so we say, we show that for all states, the rate of conversion is given by the ratio of the regularized and and this framework is reversible. So we do recover um, the reversibility. And I want to stress what this means. This means, uh, I mean, because of the issues in the previous kind of um, conjectured forms of reversibility, this is the first complete framework for reversible um, entanglement manipulation. This actually applies also to more general, general contributions because the operations are defined in the same way as Fernando and Martin did. So we have essentially the same underlying assumptions and, and we can apply them also to general quantum resources. Um, we can also generalize our irreversibility results uh, to show that this uh, choice of operations is essentially optimal. So we recover this complete characterization of uh, the landscape of reversibility. So we, we have reversibility with these probabilistic maps, uh, probabilistic operations, uh, sorry, probabilistic asymptotic non-entangling operations. But for anything smaller than that, essentially in this probabilistic setting, we have irreversibility. So this is the smallest set of operations that can give us irreversibility in this setting. Um, okay, and I would like to uh, go through the main proof ideas uh, because I found them quite interesting. Uh, the converse bound is already, so the upper bound on the race is already non-trivial because uh, usually, the way you would show such a bound is, for example, to use properties of the relative entropy of entanglement, like the asymptotic continuity of the entropy. Uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in the setting for the probabilistic rates. It does not work. So, what we have to use to get around that is, is known as the asymptotic equiprotection property, which essentially connects the robustness, the general robustness, with the entropy, and then we can use some properties of the robustness to get a bound also on these probabilistic rates. And interestingly, so this is this uh, equipartition property is one of the results of uh, Fernando and Martin's uh, original paper. Um, okay, but the maybe the, the more kind of crucial part of this proof is the achievability. So how we jump achievability? So how do we, do we show that the rate is actually achievable? And to understand that, um, I would like to first look at how it was originally um, done in the conjectured framework of Fernando and Martin. They used this result called the generalized quantum Stein's lemma. So what the Stein's lemma uh, does, and I don't want to go into detail, I don't really have uh, time, but essentially the point is that we have, we get from here a sequence of measurements, two outcome measurements that can distinguish very well between many copies of a quantum, quantum state row and all several states. And that's all we have to know for here. Uh, what we do now is we can define channels, essentially define, we do this measurement obtained from the quantum size lemma. And if we obtain this uh, this outcome corresponding to rho, then we prepare our target state omega. If we obtain the other outcome, we prepare a separable state. 
Uh, essentially, what this means, because this channel, this measurement, can distinguish very well between rho and separable states, if we act on rho, then we obtain our state omega. And I want to stress, we are doing the conversion from rho to omega. So it's exactly what we want. We want to convert from rho to omega. And But if we act on a separable state, we get a separable state back, approximately. So this operation is, is um, non-entangling, approximately. That's the crucial point. It, it does the, the protocol we wanted, and it is also uh, within this class of allowed transformations. Uh, but yes, but the issue is that the generalized quantum precise lemma is not known to be true because of the issues in the underlying uh, works. So what can we do? Well, we had a look at the paper of Fernando and Martin, and uh, what they did was they did a very careful analysis of the strong converse quantum state level. So what that means is, essentially, we still get a sequence of measurements. They can still discriminate to some extent between rho and separable states. But now the issue is that we don't know if this conversion, um, I mean, the error can, here can be large. Essentially, we know that they behave nicely when they act on separable states, so we can still kind of distinguish in, in a way because it's, it's not symmetric. So they distinguish, discriminate well between, discriminate, they don't mistake separable, separable states for rho, but they can mistake rho for a separable state. Um, so this causes issues, again, we have a large error possibly in this conversion. So the question is, how can we uh, fix this, this error? And uh, the idea we have is to fix it probabilistically. So um, essentially what we do is we add a parameter here in this conversion, in this, uh, in this map. This parameter, if we make it less than one, this uh, decreases the probability, the probability of getting the separable outcome, uh, but at the cost of making this whole transformation no longer a channel, it's now a, like a sub-channel, a probabilistic map. Uh, but what we show, the most kind of, uh, I mean, the, the main essentially uh, result here is that we show that we can choose this mu and parameter suitably in a way that conditioned on the success for rho, we get exactly, I mean, we get approximately our desired target state omega, and for separable state, this operation gives us approximately a separable state, so it is approximately non entangling which is exactly what we uh, wanted. So it does the conversion we wanted. So yeah, just to kind of to, to reiterate, the idea is to take a strong converse protocol, so one with a possibly large error, and then make it achievable so that it decreases the error uh, by turning it into a probabilistic protocol. That's the basic idea. And I want to kind of stress here that both directions actually rely on results of Fernando Martin, just so essentially we took the results that they uh, obtained in the paper and made them into a reversible framework, even though the originally conjectured framework is not known to be um, reversible. Um, okay, yes, so to summarize, I introduced the first complete framework that allows for reversibility of general quantum resources um, and in particular quantum entanglement. That was the most tricky one to, um, to understand in the setting. Um, so what this shows in particular is this connection between uh, not just many quantum resources together, but this in particular with, with quantum thermodynamics. It allows for the establishment of like a proper uh, rigorous second law of, of, of quantum resources and gives us a unique entropic measure of, of quantum resources uh, in the asymptotic uh, conversion uh, setting. Uh, we showed the results optimal in the sense that essentially we get irreversibility for all small sets of operations. Uh, I want to stress, we do not recover the originally conjectured uh, reversibility in the works of Fernando and Martin. But what I believe we do is we provide strong evidence that reversibility is an achievable phenomenon. So because before this, essentially, we didn't have a single uh, way to make a tunnel reversible, but now we do. And um, also it provides evidence that these asymptotically non entangling operations are the, the suitable choice for the reversibility. Uh, now, this still leaves a lot of open questions, though. So um, for, there may be other ways to recover reversibility. We don't know. Um, we don't know what exactly makes entanglement so much more tricky to reversibly convert than, for example, thermodynamics. Uh, these questions are interesting to study. But most importantly, the big open question here is uh, to recover the original statement, to recover the connection with the generalized quantum Steins lemma and quantum hypothesis testing. And to, to see essentially if entanglement can be manipulated uh, reversibly in that setting also. And I want to kind of maybe provide some very quick intuition for why we think um, this is actually true. Um, you remember I mentioned this kind of hierarchy of rates. 
that any achievable rate is not bounded by a prob probabilistic rate, and then we have a, a strong converse rate. But actually, uh, for every case where we can compute these rates in all kinds of tasks in quantum information, the strong converse rates always equal the achievable rate. We don't have a single example of an IID quantum information task in which these rates are different. We have zero such examples. Uh, so essentially, the most likely scenario here is that all these rates are uh, equal, and they only hold the regular relative entropy. And we provide evidence in this direction, uh, but the complete proof is left as an exercise to the reader. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bartosz. Thanks, Bartosz, for the nice talk. So is there any question? There, can you uh, ask the microphone? Um, so the, uh, the strong converse rate, uh, is it clear that it, uh, is a strong converse rate from your result? It doesn't mean that the strong converse rate is also the fraction of the regularized relative entropies, or is there a possibility that it's locked? No, 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 we don't know. Uh... No, I mean, the strong converse, for example, but the, okay, so the strong converse of the stable entanglement, is, uh, no, I mean, we know this for some cases, but not in general, no, in general. Like, but uh, if there, like, wouldn't you construct a perpetual mobile if you would have a larger rate or it's, it's not clear? Not clear. Thanks. Um, can I ask about reversibility in this setting? Like, you go from n copies of rho to n copies of sigma, and then you have some probability of failure, and it, it, it did, could that probability of failure be different on the way back? And then in, in what way is that reversible? Yes. Uh, so essentially, okay, so the way we understand these rates is usually when you have a protocol, when you're manipulating many copies of rho, right, with some protocol, uh, you ask how many copies of rho, that's the, the way you define rates, is you ask how many copies of rho you need. Well, what, what we do now is we essentially allow you to repeat this protocol many times, right? That's how you have to do, I mean, uh, for a probabilistic transformation to succeed, you have to repeat it many, many times. But essentially we change our kind of figure of merit or we change the cost function. We are now asking not how many copies of row we have to generate because you might have to repeat the protocol many times, but how many of them you have to manipulate at once. So essentially we are concerned with the size of this protocol, right? So we, we essentially, we ignore the, probability of success needed as long as it is non-zero. So as long as this kind of realizable in practice, we don't actually care about the probability. Uh, so it, it can very well be different uh, on the way back. Yeah. And, and so how is that? That doesn't sound like reversible. Well, it's reversible if you ask about, uh, if you uh, define rate in this way. If you uh, define rate by asking how many states you're manipulating. Uh, I, I mean, that's the point. Actually, if you change the definition, if you change your figure of merit, if you change your kind of definition of rate, you get reversibility, but uh, you have to uh, accept this change to accept this uh, reversibility result. Yeah. Yes, non zero probability. Yeah. Yes, it's reversible. I'm sorry, is it really reversible with non zero probability? Because I mean, what did you? Yes. <laughs> you, do the, you need two uh, protocols, one for each side, right? Uh, yes, but both of them have non-zero probability. So, if you, so overall, you have a non-zero probability. Uh, essentially, you have to accept the fact that you ignore the exact probability with which you succeed. But if you if you allow that and you know it's non-zero, if you're happy with just non-zero, then it is reversible. Uh, yeah. It is, different, it is different from the way that usually well, you exactly count how many copies, like how many times you have to repeat. I, 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 it is different definition of a rate, but that's a crucial part. Like uh, if you essentially ask, if you keep track of, of the probability inside of the rate definition, you cannot actually do any better than deterministic rates. What we show here is that you can actually maybe improve on deterministic rates if you allow this modified definition of, of, what, of what, what a rate means. Other questions? Okay. That's very interesting. So, do you know anything about the dilations of like how large the what's what dilations in what sense? Like, if you consider unitary dilations, like how difficult is to implement this maps? Yeah. Uh, no, we don't know actually anything about that. We don't know anything about that. We don't know anything about that also in the original setting of non-entangling non operations. 
We don't know how difficult they have to implement in practice. They are more like um, axiomatic like physical mathematics. We don't know um, how to implement the physics in the unit of reason. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, let's uh, thanks, Steve, again.